Hey friends, just like the eventual heat death of the universe, you're almost guaranteed to get another video from me talking about spec kit. And today I'm going to be talking about some of the updates that we pushed to the tooling while you were gone or while I was gone from streaming another video. So let's get started. First of all, I want to talk about how the, our CLI became a little bit more sane and acting like a proper CLI when you talk about bootstrapping products in the same folder, for example. Now, all of this comes, by the way, on the heels of the fact that we added support for more agents. Of course we did, because it's the, the thing that's being most in demand, but let, let's take a look here. So I'm gonna use, I'm gonna create actually a new folder. So I'm gonna do mkdir and then test two. Let's go to test two. And here, if you remember, if you use specify before, you had to use basically dash dash here, right? So you'd use something like, uh, specify init and then here and this would essentially bootstrap the project in that folder well you might have seen a peak just now but what i can do is just use the period which is exactly what any other cli would do in a typical scenario like this so, so me selecting the period would essentially bootstrap the project within the folder that i'm currently in and then i have a boatload of agents to select from so we have copilot claude gemini cursor agent and many many more we just added code body just today there's amazon q ru and so on and so forth so the things that you've already seen but i'm going to use copilot here and i'm going to use powershell nothing changed but we also added a number of other improvements that i want to talk about and the first one of them is going to be commands and the commands are now much better structured let's take a look why so better structured commands are actually super helpful because if you look inside the existing slash commands interface in VS Code or whatever tool you have, uh, you might have command overlap. For example, clarify might exist or implement might exist already. How do you differentiate between the two? Well, let's take a look here. I'm going to jump in right into my VS Code for my product. So we're going to do code. And then you'll see that if I do slash commands, like specify, Notice that now I have this prefix, it's spec kit. So all the commands that are spec kit specific, you'll be able to just type in spec kit dot specify, or you can just type in specify, and this is gonna still land you to the command that you want, right? So it's super convenient, super easy. Now, in addition to all of this stuff, we wanted to also make it easier for you to bootstrap your projects. So if you're using for example, Visual Studio Code, and this is specifically for VS Code and Copilot, uh, you'll also get some improvements to how these commands are being bubbled up from the very beginning. So here I have my constitution, specify, plan, task, and implement right at my fingertips. Super easy. So if I hover over, I get the description, which is also kind of neat. So if I'm new to this project, I just bootstrap that. I can just click on constitution, static site. Boom. That's kind of it. That's that's the amount of work that I need to do here. And I don't actually need to go and run the command individually or type in manually, just click the button. And then you can start a new chat session and jump in the next command, right? So if I just stop here and we'll show you this and click on this plus, notice that now I have my specify command. So I can just go and do that after the constitution ended and actually is placed in my folder. So that's kind of neat. Now let's jump into the next improvement. Now, another improvement that we added here is in terms of script runtime. If you remember, we have helper scripts inside our folders that enable us to make the command execution or the spec execution a little bit more predictable because helper scripts provide context, right? So if I want to run a helper script to give me the paths for my spec, my data model, there is a shell script or a PowerShell script for that. Uh, if I want to create a new branch, I have a shell script for that or a PowerShell script for that. Now, with those things, if you've been using them in VS Code, for example, with Copilot, you might have been nagged to constantly like allow the script to run, which is a good security measure. It should be there, but it's not exactly efficient because you constantly have to click that button. So that annoyance is actually now solved by the fact that we bundle for Copilot, specifically for Copilot uh, packages, these options for command auto approval. So you, we have the specified scripts, bash and PowerShell, and I could probably just simplify this to just use scripts, but they're automatically approved. So whenever you run these commands in your um, actual editor, so in VS Code specifically, so we're gonna jump back here to my other project, you'll notice that the commands will get auto approved. You're gonna get this auto approved by rule, specify scripts, PowerShell, and so you never actually get prompted to allow it to run, it just runs and gets out of the way. So again, kind of a neat little thing. It's a general productivity improvement. And then let's jump to the next one. 
another new capability that we added is essentially unit tests for English. So when John and I were talking about some of the improvements that we could make here, one of the problems that we struggled to kind of wrap our head around is the idea of underspecification. And we've talked about underspecification on my videos before. It's basically the problem of you not knowing that you don't know something for the spec, right? The unknown unknowns are a pretty big problem. So how do you mitigate them? How do you avoid underspecifying things when you don't actually know them from scratch? Well, for that, you might build out specific checklists that are domain specific. You might have a checklist for UX, a checklist for security, a checklist for maybe accessibility. And these checklists are intentionally detached from technology. Just as we talked about the spec itself being detached from the tech or the implementation, the checklists themselves are not necessarily looking at things like, do you have proper unit tests? Or are you actually implementing the podcast page component? This is more about actual spec details. So to do that, we use the slash checklist command, and it's also prefixed with a spec kit. So I'm going to use slash checklist. There we go. And I'm going to use the domain in this case is going to be UX because I want to create a checklist for my user experience. Now, what this will do is notice that it's going to run a script. And as I mentioned before, it's automatically approved by the rules that I have here. So I don't actually have to uh, approve anything and it just keeps going. And as it's going to look at the domain that I asked it to, it's also going to look through the template of checklist because we now have a template that gives you like bullet point lists that it needs to go through. And it's going to populate it based on the domain that I asked it to cover. So in this case, UX, again, it could be security, it could be anything else. And this is also going to generate a list of things for me to go and think about the spec if there's any areas that might be underspecified or any areas that require additional information that were not covered in the initial iteration. So you might not have seen the initial first steps when I just bootstrapped this spec for my podcast landing page. But essentially, this is it's a simple project, right? There's not a lot of stuff that I actually added in the initial prompt. But that also means that as I move on to further steps, a lot of this information becomes um, very much implied. And implied information is bad because implied information means that the LLM starts guessing things instead of you expli explicitly specifying it. So that's the problem. Let's take a look here now at the UX checklist. So I'm going to keep the file. I'm going to go here and we're going to close this and close our terminal. And let's take a look here. So our visual hierarchy requirements define for all three page types right? Like this is not a technical implementation. That's telling me how the, those should be built. It's actually asking if those are defined. Our loading state requirements defined for page transitions and asynchronous content. Once again, this is a great uh, capability that allows me to think through these things that are not specified in the spec, but they should be that are detached from implementation. And as we go through this, you'll notice that there's um, sections, right? Like for things like requirement clarity, requirement consistency, uh, acceptance criteria, uh, right? And uh, also, I, I really like this part. For things that are metrics, for things that are measurable, it actually validates whether those are testable with defined measurement conditions. Right? So this is something that I've been looking at before. I was like, well, it can spin up a bunch of metrics. And those metrics are nice to look at, but like, are they actually testable? So these checklists allow you to basically go through the process of, am I covering everything that I need to be covering in my spec or are there any blind spots? So super, super helpful. And if you ever want to go and implement this checklist, you can just ask it. Ask ask the, the LLM to cross check the UX checklist with the spec. That's it. And when you do that, the LLM is actually going to go ahead and start checking off things based on a checklist and modifying the spec if there's any areas that are underspecified. Again, I find this super helpful for me because it enhances my thinking process. Now, let's check out the next update. The other thing that we actually improved fairly significantly is how we manage tasks. Now, if you remember in previous incarnations of SpecKit, the task breakdown included a lot of tests. So if you are building either a simple feature or a large project, you'd have a boatload of tests because, you know, TDD or test driven development is a best practice. There is a problem with that, though, is that it's not always applicable. So we cleaned it up. So now tests are entirely eliminated unless you explicitly ask for them. That's right. So if you did not ask for tests, you're not going to get tests in here in tasks. The other piece here that is a little bit more interesting is that we actually updated how the task breakdown is structured. So now 
you know, you have the ability to look at this through the lens of a product manager. That's right. If you've ever missed user stories and user scenarios, that's what it's grouped by. So now you have phase one set up shared infrastructure. You now have phase two foundational or blocking prerequisites. It's all broken down into essentially the, uh, how do you get to the MVP, the minimum viable product as fast as possible sequenced in a way that you can actually build it independently. So if you go through phase one and phase two, you now have the foundational blocks. If you do the phase three, you now have the MVP. That's kind of the piece. And then you start going through the improvements and iterations like phase four, you have user story two, browser episodes, right? Like th this allows you to iterate on the project better because I don't actually need to wait for everything to finish, to stitch together, to see the end product. I can actually iterate through phases. And when I do that, I get the ability to basically assemble them independently so that I can stop after phase two and say, okay, let me take a look at what it looks like. I can stop after phase three and ask the exact same question, right? It gives you way more flexibility as a developer and you get better outputs because then you can actually nudge the LLM in the right direction before it goes way too far in the implementation. So we're very excited about all these changes. There's more coming. Stay tuned for other updates around SpecKit. We're proactively building it out. And if there's any feedback, go to github.com slash github slash spec dash kit, open an issue, submit a pull request. We're always open to contributions and I'll see you in the next one.